Psalms number 88. I'm going to warn you. This is a different psalm. Very different. It is peculiar, you might be able to say. It's not like a lot of the other psalms. And you'll see why here in a, in a minute. But we're going to have to read the whole thing. So buckle down. I'll read quick. You listen quick. Okay, verse number 1 says, O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thine ear unto my cry, for my soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that hath no strength, free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me into the lowest pit, into darkness, in the deeps. The, thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Selah. Thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up and cannot come forth. Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? Selah. Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave, or thy faithfulness in destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark, and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But unto thee have I cried, O Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Why hidest thou thy face from me? I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. While I suffer thy ter terrors, I am distracted. Thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. They came round about me daily like water. They compassed me about together. Lover and friend hast thou put far from me, and mine acquaintance in the darkness. And that's why that one's a little weird. Unlike most psalms that start off doom and gloom, for instance, David when he's in a cave, running from Saul, running from Absalom. They always end with, the Lord's my hope, the Lord's my salvation, I'm in the Lord's... There's always a happy ending, so to speak, when it comes to Psalms. Well, not this one. This one says, verse number 17, they, referring to fierce wrath and the terrors of God, come round about me daily like water. Lover and friend, in verse number 18, hast thou put far from me my acquaintance in the darkness. That's where it ends. So I started doing a little bit of digging. I like things that are different. I like oddities. Not that this is odd. It's just different than most of the rest of them. So I went over here before verse number one. It says, A song or psalm for the sons of Korah to the chief musician upon Mah Mahalath and then Laanoth. That's not the important part. Mashal of Haman the Ezraite. Now, first off, what's that word mashal mean? And I'm not saying that right, but I'm not Hebrew. Okay? So mashal. Okay, it means wisdom, or as some people that wanted to give them a name, okay, this is a diadetic psalm, meaning it is one that is meant to provoke thought. It's one that's meant to teach a lesson. Okay? Not necessarily one that you're going to sing every Sunday when you come in to church to sing praise unto God. But you sing this song to teach others what the one that wrote it was trying to get across. Then we've got the writer. Haman, it's spelled He-Man. It's not He-Man. It's Haman. Okay. Haman the Ezraite. But there's three Hamans in the Bible. And nowhere does it say that all three of them are the same. But I'm pretty sure that all three of them are the same. Bear with me. i got to give you a little bit of a lesson. I looked in a whole bunch of different books. Nobody agreed. Everybody had their own theory. Well, I looked at all the references, and here's my theory. I'm no more wrong than anybody else. But it's the only thing that made sense, and I'll tell you why. First, uh, Haman. Okay, you, I thought you would be able to find Haman the Ezraite, and then that cleared up. Right? Find that somewhere else? Didn't work. Okay? Because uh, this is the only time that you'll find them called the Ezraite. Okay? It's in the caption of this psalm. But 
there was a Haman back in David's day. Yeah, he was a Levite. In fact, he was such a good Levite that David appointed him as one of the three people that were in charge of, you know, at the temple. Right? They hadn't built Solomon's temple yet, but at the temple, there were three people that were in charge of singing, music, and worship. Haman was one of them. One of the other ones was his relative named Ethan. Okay, well, just for a second, look at Psalm 89. Mashal of Ethan, the Ezraite. Okay, well, you got two dudes right here named Ezraite. Okay, they were related, Haman and Ethan that we were talking about in David's day. They both had the same job. So whether it's talking about where they came from, it's referring to their family, or whether it was what job they had, okay, where we can make the argument here that, hey, these two, probably the same two guys that David put in charge of singing and worshiping and playing instruments at the house of God. Because okay, not just anybody gets to write Psalm 88, a song or psalm for the sons of court to the chief musician. Not everybody gets to sin a psalm or a song unto God to, you know, the best music player or the director of the best music company in the whole nation. Right? David could because David was king. Right? David also loved the Lord. That's why he wrote down a lot of psalms. But not just anybody could do that, but Haman, if he was one of the three guys that was in charge of worship at the house of God, he, he could have done that. So could have his brother Ethan who was also called an Ezraite, chapter number 89. It, well, now, we can go over to the book of 2 Kings, and you're going to find that when it talks about Solomon being given the gift of wisdom from God, it says that Solomon's wisdom was greater than Ethan the Ezraite, and then the next name, and Haman. And then it goes on to list a whole bunch of other people. Well, in David's day, those two guys that were in charge of, well, not just them two two of the three guys that were in charge of all the worship at the house of God they were also known as very wise men they had applied themselves to the things of God and God had blessed them with wisdom but then when Solomon comes along it says those two guys compared to Solomon they're idiots right? they, were, they were very wise but Solomon's even more the wiser so if the two guys that were in charge of worship and were very wise were to write psalms both of them wrote a psalm of mashil meaning a song of wisdom a song to teach doesn't that just make sense thought it made sense to me then I went and I looked at it and I said well I wonder if I'm right about this nobody nobody else could find that in all the commentaries Everybody else is saying, well, it could have been a guy that lived all the way back in Egypt. Really? We already know that Ethan the Ezraite, they, they called him that in Second Kings, by the way. Okay, so if that was the same one, it would just make sense that his brother, who was also an Ezraite, same guy. Okay, so that's the premise we're operating off of today. If you don't agree with me, take it up with God, because he's the one that settled it. But, put all that together with the fact that this psalm doesn't have a happy ending okay, in fact the guy who wrote this psalm is in the same position with the same outlook nothing has changed from the beginning of this psalm to the end that his situation hasn't changed his outlook hasn't changed God hasn't changed right nothing changed from start to beginning usually in dreary psalms it's Lord, I need to roll all these burdens off on you. Like Peter said, I'm going to cast all my cares upon you so that my attitude can pick up a little bit. So that my situation may not change, but I can handle the situation differently. Because I've given it all to God, and that's good enough for me. We don't find that here. Nothing changes. So bear with me here for a second. We know that the writer of this psalm, first off, that... He's got his hope in the right place. Look at verse number 1. O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Okay, then in verse number 9, he calls 
Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. And then, verse number 13, But unto thee have I cried, O Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. Verse number 14, Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Every time in the Old Testament that you see the word Lord in all caps, but the L is a little bit bigger than the capital of everything else, that's literally referring to the name Jehovah. But the Hebrews had such fear of God and respect for the name of God that they wouldn't write out the name of God. So they would abbreviate it and leave out the vowels. That's where the term Yahweh that a lot of people like to bring up. That was the name Jehovah without the vowels in it. So they would say that in honor and respect that God's name shouldn't come from the mouth of a sinful man like me. So when writing, if he were to write Lord as many times as he did, he's pretty serious. Because he's not using the name of God you know, frivolously. Get one of the Ten Commandments. Shall not take the name of the Lord God in vain. It's a whole lot more than what we would apply it to today. Right? They took it so seriously that they wouldn't even write the whole name of God out for fear of how holy that name was. So for him to not only utter it in his prayer but also to pin it down for other people to read. He's very serious. Okay, then, in verse number 1, he says, though that, O Lord God of my salvation. He says, all my hopes in God. He's got that part right. That I believe that this man did all that was necessary. Whether And we need to take a step back. Was this an account of Haman's life? I don't know. Was this an account of somebody else's life that Haman had heard about? I don't know. But this is what I think that this psalm is kind of like one of them thought experiments. Right? That this can apply to many different situations. For instance, you know, anybody ever heard of the story of the tortoise and the hare? Right? You can apply that to anything if you take enough time to figure out how it connects. You can use it as an example for almost anything. Right? A thought experiment, perhaps like well, what happens when an unmovable force meets an unstoppable or an immovable object meets an unstoppable force? Well, there's a lot of different ways that that could shake out. But it's meant to provoke thought. Okay, so as I read this, I mean, we could look at this a whole bunch of different ways. We could look at this as, you know, somebody that realized that they were lost and then turned to God. But because they were lost, they made a mess of their life. And they turned to God to get saved. But they're asking the Lord, Lord, I'm just putting faith in you to sort out all of my mess. You saved me, but Lord, I'm just praying that you'd give me a life more abundantly. Right? Because God can save you from your sin, but sometimes we still got to pay the price for the sin that we committed. God's not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Right, we can read this as somebody that was taken off into captivity. Right, Babylon, well, we know that Haman wasn't. In fact, we find out that even when Israel turned their back on God, Haman and some of the other Levites, like Asaph, he's another famous one that you'll find in the Psalms, that it was either written by him or it was written to him. He was the third one, by the way, that was in charge of worship at the temple that David had appointed above the rest of them, made him accountable for worship to happen at the house of God. Well, after Israel comes out of captivity, after Nebuchadnezzar, after Babylon, after the Medes and the Persians, and after you know Rome comes in and allows them to start worshiping again the way that they desire to worship, when they set up the temple, they sought out Levites that had been faithful. And guess who they found? They found descendants of a whole bunch of them, but Asaph and Haman. But I don't believe that this is an account of Haman's life because Haman instilled into his children the fear of God so much and their children into the next that when it came time for the temple to be reinstated, they were still found acceptable to be in charge or to participate in the worship at the house of God. You don't get that if you're living a wicked life. 
You don't get appointed by David, a man after God's own heart, to be in charge of worship at the house of God if David knows that your life isn't honorable unto God. Because if a Levite didn't purify himself accordingly, he couldn't take part in those things. He had to follow the law as God said, you have to be this way in order to do things at my house. You've got to wear these clothes. You've got to purify yourself. You've got to make sacrifice for yourself. You've got to make sacrifice for others. But not only that, the descendants of Haman, when the temple comes back around under Herod, they all know how to play music still. Well, if you're in captivity and you're a musician, you don't get the option to choose whether or not you're still a musician. They could say, no, today you're making bricks out of mud. They could say, no, today you're going to be serving you know, appetizers at this rich guy's house for this big banquet that he's having. But regardless of whatever came their way, Haman's whole descendants still thought it's important to know how to play instruments to sing praise and honor and glory unto God. I don't think that a guy in the situation of Psalm 88 matches with Haman. That's why I think it's a thought experiment. This is an example, kind of like Jesus' parables. Had an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. I think it's the same thing here. Okay, so now that we got that out of the way. This guy's got his eyes on the right spot. He's looking to God for help. But as I read it, and I start thinking about it, this is what God showed me. The one that we're going to look at today, not talking about somebody that's a prodigal, not talking about somebody that you know, is in captivity, not talking about somebody that just got saved and you know, their life's a wreck and they're begging God to fix it because they've made a mess of it. They follow after me here. This is somebody that knows God because he says, that the Lord is the God of his salvation. That means he's invested everything into God. He said, all I'm hoping in is you. Okay, step in the right direction. Right, he's, he got off on the right foot. Then verse number 2, we see that he's very serious about this because he's not just praying this for the first time. Verse number 2, it says, Let my prayer come before thee, incline thine ear unto my cry, for my soul is full of troubles. Okay, then, look in verse number 9. Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. And then, it says in... Uh oh I lost it. Verse number 13. But unto thee have I cried, O Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. Now we got pause. That word prevent isn't the way that we use prevent nowadays. In Webster's 1828 dictionary, you'll find that there was an archaic form of the word prevent that had definitions that we don't use anymore. They replaced those with new words. So when they translated it, prevent had two meanings. One, it meant to stop something. right? Like I can prevent this from happening. That's not what this means. In fact, that was the lesser used term back then. Prevent means to proceed or to come before which still kind of makes sense if I'm going to prevent something from happening i got to get in front of it and stop it but what the psalmist is saying is Lord wherever you go in the morning I'm going to come before you reverently, honorably and I'm going to pray diligently that this problem get rectified he's saying no matter what comes Kind of like Daniel. He said, doesn't matter what the king says. Doesn't matter what all the princes say. In the morning, my prayers shall prevent God or come before God. They're going to be known unto Almighty God. They're going to be open. They're going to be done with everything that I've got. Right? In fact, you know, David wrote, early will I seek thee. This guy said, as early as I can get up. That's when my prayers are going to be no, de no delay. In fact, he said that his prayers were constantly before God in verse number 9. What's that mean? Doesn't matter how tired he was in the morning. Doesn't matter how busy he got during the day. Doesn't matter how tired he was at the end of the day after all the work had been done. His prayer was constantly before God. I think that he had down what Paul wrote long before Paul wrote it. Pray without ceasing. So we know that this man, first, he's a child of God. Maybe not in the New Testament sense, but he was one of God's chosen people. 
He was a child of God. Then we also know that this guy knows how to pray. And he takes it seriously. So why then, if you're one of God's children, and you're praying not just the minimum amount, not just, you know, every now and then when I remember, I'll, I'll bring this up to God. No, it says continuously. This guy prayed so much that everybody else knew what this guy was praying about. It was so much a part of it, he couldn't separate. Right? Whether he went into the temple and he prayed openly, or but people knew this guy had something he wanted from God. But then also notice his attitude. Nowhere does he demand anything from God. Nowhere does he expect anything from God. In fact, you can look through everything that he said, and all that he's asking is, Lord, can you remove me from the place where I'm at? Doesn't demand it. In fact, what he's begging is, Lord, restore me to what I was. That's what he's praying. Okay, so, what situation is this guy in? That's a pretty bad situation. I've heard of doom and gloom, but this is so doom and gloom, this guy's only hope is God. Spurgeon theorized that this was written by a guy that had leprosy. I don't think that checks out. And I'll show you here in a second. Okay, verse number three. For my soul is full of troubles. My life draws nigh unto the grave. What's that mean? He thinks that the sorrow, the agony, whether it's inward or outward, what this guy's going through, it's so grievous unto him that he thinks his body can't handle it. It brings to mind when the devil's trying to kill Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and his body's hemorrhaging. Right? The devil's trying to do everything he could to kill Jesus in the garden before he can get to the cross. I've got that same type of agony in my mind as I'm reading. He's saying, Lord, if I go through this, I'm so stressed that it's more than just my hair turning gray. It's falling out. Right? You ever had such a concern that you start to think that you've got ulcers? Maybe this guy is full of ulcers because his situation, it's eating him up. And he's saying, Lord, if you don't do something, I'm either spiritually or physically going to die. He says, all my hope is in you. So, verse number four, I encountered with them that go down to the pit. You guys remember when we got that Greek uh, word picture? Condemned? Right, that those that believe not are condemned already? Okay, well... It's similar to what this... He's saying, I'm counted with those that go down into the pit, those that are dead. He's saying, I'm not dead yet, but they've already got my plot picked out. They've got a sign written across my chest, this guy's dead. Dead man walking, as they used to say. He may still be kicking now, but he's not long. Pretty grave situation. Okay, then, it says that I'm a man, as a man that has no strength, free among the dead like the slain that lie in the grave. In other words, he's saying everywhere that he looks, he sees death, destruction. He sees the bones that are laying in the ground, but yet he's free among the dead. That means he's able to walk around and survey all the destruction. He's the only one that he can see. Everything else is dead. He knows he's soon to die, but yet he's still able to get up and walk around. He's saying, everywhere that I go, I'm free, but everywhere I go, there's, there's, there's no life. There's nothing for me. Nothing to strengthen me. He says, I'm a man that has no strength. He said, I've worn myself out. The only thing that's going to change this is God. So then, it says, whom, talking about those that are in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. He's saying, God, I feel as if he knows it's not true because he's still praying to God. So he knows God can still hear him and God can still reach out to him. He's still got hope, but he's saying this despair, every now and then, if I let it get the best of me, I start convincing myself that God can't get to where I'm going. He's saying there are times that it feels like, maybe as Job said, that 
the thing that he feared had come upon him. He looked to the north, he looked to the left, he looked to the right, he looked behind him, and he could not perceive where God was. Job still knew that God was there, but just like this man, he's saying, God, every now and then, if I don't remind myself better, I'm convinced that I'm in a place that you can't come to. He says, that's what it feels like. That's how alone that he feels. His solitude is so immense that every now and then his flesh even convinces him that God can't even get to where he's at. You ever been there? And once you convince yourself of something, really hard to unconvince yourself, well, this guy hadn't given in to that yet. He's still saying, Lord, I know better. But he also said that I'm going to cast my weakness upon God. He says, Lord, that's my sinful flesh. I know that that's the part of me that doesn't believe, but part of me does believe. And by everything I can do, that's going to be the stronger thing. So the thing, I mean, verse number 6, Thou hast laid me into the lowest pit, in the darkness, in the deeps. Everything that he mentions from verse number 3 down to verse number 6 talks about him being alone. He's in a deep, dark pit that nobody else can get into except for God. Right? He is as a dead man, but he's the only one that can still get up and walk around. He's free among the dead. Everywhere he looks, he sees nothing. But yet he still knows that there's hope in God. In fact, we get down in verse number 8. It says, Thou hast put mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up and cannot come forth. He says, you did more than just take my acquaintances. They may not have been friends. Could have been co-workers. Could have been colleagues. Could have been people that he lived next door to, his neighbors. Right? Wasn't his family, wasn't his friends. But he says, my acquaintances. We all got a lot of acquaintances. Right? In fact, if we sat down and started thinking about it, we got more acquaintances than we even realized. That's why Paul said, we're written epistles, known and read of all men. There are a whole lot more people to get a look of our life. But he's saying, everybody that I've ever known has deserted me. In fact, he said that God made him an abomination unto them. It means that they hated him. That they saw what this man had become and they had turned their backs on him and said, we're never coming back. Now, I mean, David kind of knows what that feels like. He said, every man forsook, nevertheless, the Lord stood by him. This guy has the same thought, Lord, everybody else has left me. But notice, David knew that people hated him for the wrong reasons. Saul hated him because Saul was jealous. Okay, that wasn't the wrath of God. That was Saul's wrath. That was his sinfulness. That was his pride that came up against David. Look at Absalom. What happened there? Again, pride welled up in somebody else. That wasn't God's judgment and wrath upon David. But yet look at verse number 7. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Selah. I think of that as a ship out there in the middle of the ocean that's got waves crashing on it from every side. Nowhere for escape. It's stuck in one spot, and everything is just more and more and more. And it says all his ways, every direction, everything that God could send at this guy's life. He even says Selah afterwards. He's saying, think about it. Everything that God could have taken, everything that God could have done to me, he did it. He says, take some time and think about it. Think about all that you have to lose. And he says, God took it. Because it says wrath. Now again, thought experiment. This guy knew God, was a child of God. He knew how to pray. But I don't think this guy's life is where it's supposed to be. Whether it was real or whether it's a metaphorical example. Because God doesn't pour out wrath on people that are faithful. God doesn't pour wrath out on people that are obedient. God doesn't pour wrath out upon those whose sole desire is to love God. And let's be honest, most of the time, even when we deserve wrath, God doesn't send wrath upon us then. 
God corrects his own. That's why the Bible says if you're without chastisement, you're a bastard and not a son. But chastisement and wrath are two different things. Chastisement still has love in it. Wrath is when you've made yourself the enemy of God. God does not pour out wrath upon those that still follow it. We can look at any of the times that Israel was taken into captivity. Those that were faithful unto God who hadn't turned their back on God, that hadn't been idolatrous, that hadn't turned themselves over to you know, filthy lucre, that hadn't been lascivious in their lifestyles, God took care of those people. They were a part of God's wrath, but God made a way for them to where He still took care of them. I mean, do we need to go to Daniel and the three Hebrews? Do we need to go to Ezra? Do we need to go to Nehemiah? Those that had a burning desire in their heart, notice all of them found a position favorable in the eyes of their captor. You think that's a mistake? You think that Joseph, after his brothers tried to kill him, that it was just coincidence that everywhere that he went, God made a way for him to find favor with those that were in charge? He spent a little time in jail, but God used jail to get him to Pharaoh's hand. That was not God's wrath. That was the wrath of Joseph's brothers. That was the wrath of men against one of God's children. And God said, doesn't matter what you do to them, I'm going to bring them out the other side better. That's not the picture we get here. This is a man that knows his current situation came from the hand of God. And after it hit his life, that's when we find that he realizes God's his salvation. That's when we find him praying continually. The wrath of God hit, and then we find him very diligent towards God. Which begs the question, what does life look like beforehand? Well, if he's got the wrath of God in his life, that means that not only was he disobedient, that means that when God tried to woo him back, look at every time that God tried to warn Israel about the coming wrath of God, the judgment that God would pour out upon his people, he always had a messenger. He always had a prophet, always had a man of God to stand up and say, repent. Judgment's coming, but God's giving you a space to get it made right. Well, God's no respecter of persons. So in order for him to have the wrath of God poured out on his life, he had to run through the roadblocks of God's chastisement. Which means not only was he disobedient, he was belligerent. He wouldn't turn around and admit, no Lord, I'm not coming back and doing what you want. I'm going to do what I want to do. And we find he built up a pretty good life. He was pretty successful. He had many acquaintances. Look in verse number 17. They came about me daily like water. They can pass me about together. Lover and friend hast thou put far from me and mine acquaintance in the darkness. He's saying, everything that I used to know, everybody that I used to know, God put them so far away from me that I can't even see the outline of them on the horizon. He's saying, God took it all and put it so far away that the only thing left was for me to look unto God. Now, I've heard it preached many a times, and I've, knock on wood, never been foolish enough yet to try and put it to test. But it is a very dangerous thing to put something in your life before God because you're tempting God to remove it from your life. I see in Psalm 88, Haman the Ezra, Ezraite saying, don't be like this guy. This guy knew all the right teachings because he knew how to get his prayer before God. This guy knew beforehand, he knew how to pray. But he starts doing all of it too little, too late. He should have prayed long before the wrath of God came. He should have prayed when God tried to correct him. But instead of correction, he embraced his plan for his life. Well, look with me. Verse number 9, he says, My eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Well, what does that mourneth mean? Some say it means to cease to function. 
If you're mourning something, you can't do anything else. If you have a loved one and you're going through the process of grieving them and mourning their passing, you're not thinking about anything else. You're begging God to deal with what's before you. That thing that's heaviest on your heart. Well, imagine this is the heaviest thing in this guy's life. He's crying so much that his eyes don't work. He's so broken that he can't even open his eyes. Because when he opens his eyes, he sees that he's free among the dead. He sees that he's already marked with the dead. He's a man going down into the pit. He's just waiting for the hammer to drop. So if you were that way, your eyes would stop working too. Because they'd be shut and you'd be prone before God, begging God not to give you what you do deserve. I believe that that's where this man is. In fact, he even tries to read from verse number 10 down to verse number 14. He starts reminding himself of God's goodness. Because if he didn't have hope in God, he wouldn't have prayed to God in the first place. If he was so far gone that he didn't even retain God in his conscience, God would have turned him over to the destruction of the flesh so that the soul might be saved. God would have killed him for his soul's sake. But yet after suffering God's judgment and his wrath, he starts thinking to himself these questions. He's asking God these questions, but he already knows the answers to these questions. Again, it's a psalm meant to provoke thought. We know the answers to these questions. So, verse number 9, or verse number 10, Will thou show wonders to the dead? God doesn't do miraculous things so that dead people can talk about it. Right? The living are those that are meant to praise God on the face of the earth so that others can know that our God is good, our God is great, and He is Jehovah God. He says, Lord, I know that you won't kill me so that I can sing praises about you. I know that you don't show great miracles to the dead because the dead can't tell anybody. He says, so the fact that I'm still here means that you want me to go tell somebody about how good you really are. So his hope is, is that God won't kill him if he can get back to being right with God. Because he'll be able to tell others about how good God was. It. Even though he suffered God's wrath, he didn't suffer the full extent of it. Because if God truly would have poured out judgment for this man's sin, he wouldn't be a trace of him. He'd exploded. Right? He'd have been in hell with his back broke. So he's saying, Lord, as long as you don't kill me, I can still tell others about how good you've been to me, even though he has nothing. God took it all, he said. But yet he still says, just because God is merciful and gracious, if I'm still alive, I can tell somebody. But he says, but I need God to get me out of this pit that I've got myself into so I can go find somebody. Because he says, everything around me right now is dead. So he's saying, Lord, if you'll get me up out of the pit, I believe he's already gotten right with God. He's just begging God to use him one more time. He's been praying every day. He's been praying morning, noon, and night. His prayer's constantly been before God. He's just begging God, Lord, I know I don't deserve it, but if it'd be all right, let me go tell somebody about how good you've been to me despite me. Because he says, Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? He says, Lord, why have you been merciful to me? You took everything. You could have taken my life. You showed me mercy. So let me go tell about your wonders to somebody else. He says, you've shown me mercy for a reason. Let me go and find it. Show it to me. Then he says, shall the dead arise and praise thee? Selah. Once you're gone, too late to talk about how good God is. After we're dead, everybody's going to admit that he's Lord of Lord and King of Kings. But God doesn't desire that. That's just going to happen because he is. Every knee shall bow because they can't stand before him. Every tongue shall confess because he is. But here, not everybody realizes that. Dead aren't going to get up and start talking about all the great things that God's done. We've got great things that the Lord has done, and it's written down, penned, preserved for all this time, and yet people still don't read it. He says the dead aren't going to get up. You can't trust living people to go and find how good God's been. People got to go tell them. Then he says, Verse number, shall thy love and kindness be declared in the grave? He says, Lord, why would you show me mercy just to kill me? He says, 
I realize now I've been wrong. But Lord, how, what good is that if I can't get back to where you want me to be? He's saying the same thing that basically Moses said to the Lord when the Lord wanted to kill all of Israel and start over with Moses when they started carrying around like they used to in Egypt and made the false God with the golden calf as Moses is up there getting the Ten Commandments. God said, I'm going to start over. God said, or Moses said to God, Lord, what would the world think if you took your people out of captivity only to kill them in the wilderness? And then Moses came down the mountain and he wanted to kill them. But it's the same thought. The Lord honored Moses' request. But here he's saying, Lord, why would you take everything? Get me to the place where I was broken so that I'd get back to you only to send me to the grave. He's saying, that doesn't sound like God. He says, then, can you declare, in verse number 11, thy faithfulness in destruction? Well, you can. Because long before he ever brought destruction, he was faithful to warn you about it. Long before that, he was faithful to encourage you to get back to him. Long before that, he made the covenant of Abraham. So here he's saying, whether you go through the grave or whether you're still here, if you stand before God, if you get to the place where you see yourself before the throne room of Jehovah God Himself, you'll realize whether you kill me now or whether I'm alive forevermore, right? I'm without excuse to declare thy loving kindness or thy faithfulness and thy loving kindness. He says, but if I'm destroyed, I still stand before Him. He's still faithful. Long before He destroyed me. He's still faithful because you would think, well, how was God faithful if He allowed Him to be? Well, if God promised wrath and destruction and He performed it, God's faithful to His Word. It's forever settled in heaven. And he's saying, I'm without excuse now to talk about how faithful God's been. But He says, but if He destroys me, I can't tell anybody. He says, I can stand before God and declare it, but that doesn't help anybody here. Saying, if I go into the grave, nobody can talk about how faithful God's been to me. He doesn't talk about how faithful He's been to God, but He says, God's always been faithful to me. Then, verse number 12, Shall thy wonders be known in the dark, and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? The common indictment of Israel throughout all the years is that they were stiff-necked, they had a short memory, and that they sold God out. And they'd get right with God, and then the process would repeat. They had stony hearts. But in verse number 12, Shall thy wonders be known in the dark? When we turn our back from God, we shut the light out. He doesn't. He is light. He's going to be the light of the city one day that He made for us. Right? In Him, no darkness. So if we're in darkness, we had to get away from God. Sometimes God will remove His presence, but I've still got His Word, which is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. His Word is still so powerful that it provides light where I'm at. So the darkness, obviously, are those that don't know God, but in order for me to get there, and for me to be in darkness, I had to leave everything that God gave me behind. He's saying, Lord, I'm out here in the middle of nowhere, and while I'm out here, even if I'm going to die and go down to the grave, give me a light so that I can tell others, if you don't straighten up, you're going to end up like me. He's saying, who can go into the darkness unless they have light? How can you tell somebody what you've got's different if you're just as blind as they are? He's saying, Lord, I woke up, but give me something to show. Even if you don't remove me from the pit, let me be a lighthouse somewhere. Just let my voice echo off the walls of this pit. Don't come down here. Don't do it the way that I did it. He's, in other words, what he's begging is, while I've still got breath, let me tell others. You'll find that when people realize how displeased that God is or God was with their life, if they get right with God, or if they don't, they'll have the desire to tell others. What did the rich man 
say to Father Abraham, I've got some brothers. Let me go tell them. He says, they've got Moses and the prophets. If they don't believe them, they wouldn't believe it. If a dead man got up and went and told them how sinful and wicked that they were. So what he's saying is, I wonders can't be known in the dark. The righteousness cannot be known in the land of forgetfulness. He's saying, Lord, they've forgotten all about you. Maybe he forgot all about God for a time, but he's remembered. And he's saying, all around me is forgetfulness. If the ones that remember are wiped off the face of the earth, what hope is there for those that have forgotten? Again, thought experiment. He's saying, God's never changed. And if God's ways haven't changed, because He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, if His ways change not, and yet we're in this situation, what happened? Because they were in the promised land. They were in the land of, that flowed with milk and honey. Right? This man had a great life. He had tons of people around him. He had people that thought highly of him, but now he's been made abomination to him. So as I'm reading this, and we don't have time to get through the rest of it verse by verse, but in verse number 15 he says, I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. He said, now I realize my whole life's been a mess because I forgot about God. He just talked about the land of forgetfulness. He's saying, Lord, you woke me up, but now I can hindsight see that from my youth up, I've been ready to die. Everything went wrong, left, right. Everything I tried never panned out. He says, now I understand that I've been afflicted by maybe his chastisement, his correction, his reproof. But eventually God said, enough's enough, and sent wrath. And he said, first off, God could have killed me at any time. But he's also saying, without the grace of God, I could have killed myself at any time. He says, I've been ready to die. I did. Only thing keeping me from the grave was God's loving kindness, His mercy, His faithfulness. The only reason God didn't let me make so much a mess of my life that I ended up ruining everything and casting myself off into the pit. He said the only reason He didn't is because He loved me. So throughout all of this, what I see... I mean, I've said we can see a bunch of different things. But as I was studying this, the Lord shows me this. What I see is a Christian that can't let the old man die. This guy knew that the Lord was his Lord, but that he was also his hope of salvation. He knew that God was Jehovah, and that without Jehovah, he had no hope. But yet at some point, he started holding on to things instead of God. What do you find him whining about? That he lost his friends? His acquaintances? Lost his friends? I mean his family? His lovers? We don't find in here where he repented and was ashamed for all of his sin, but we do find that you know, he wouldn't have been calling on God every day if he hadn't repented. But even though he's repented, he's still asking God, God, can you give me back what I had? Because I did like them friends. Well, he liked those friends so much that God had to remove them in order for him to see God again. His family meant so much to him that God had to get him out of the way so that he could see God again. Right? Even those closest to him, says lover and friend. He says, you took the one that was everything to me so that I could see you again. But then, says, daily God's wrath and the terrors have cut him off. He doesn't realize that he's still in his situation because he's still holding on to something. Let the old man die. If it means this, or letting go of it so that God can do something in your life, let go of it. Because if you don't let go of it, God will take it from you. And if you become bitter over the fact that God took something from you, you're going to end up like this fella. His ways, he was ready to die from his youth up because he couldn't accept the fact that God knew better than he did. And so, 
to wrap it all back to Haman. Although this probably wasn't Haman's life. Haman's saying, I do know this. I've seen enough people make a mess of it that if God says let it go, release it. Why do you think this song was sung to tell others, whatever you're holding on to, it's not worth it. It's better to have God because even if you're in a pit with God, God will set a table up for you where you can have a feast before your enemies. Psalm 23. But he says, if you're on your own, you're holding on, you can get back to the place where you can call upon the name of God. But if you're still holding on, God's not going to bring you up out of that pit until you're ready to say, Lord, your ways are above my ways. Your understanding better than my understanding. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.